Aloha class. Today we're going to talk about muscles and animal movement. And uh, some of this stuff is going to be useful for your lab on human muscle and EMG. So as you know, the nervous system controls muscle movement. Information comes from the central nervous system through the peripheral nervous system. Um, this is called the efferent or the motor output to cause movement in muscles and glands. So um, movement is one of those unique features of animals. Metazoans are the only multicellular organisms that actively move. And it's because they have muscle cells or motor proteins. They do have homologs in other eukaryotes, for example, dynin and kinesin. But the first really muscle-like cells appeared in cnidarians, for example, the hydra. And as evolution has proceeded, animals have gotten more and more complex, their musculature has gotten more complex, they're able to do many more different types of movements and um, characterized by different rates and force output. And vertebrates, in fact, have the greatest diversity in muscle types, especially terrestrial vertebrates. So there's two types of vertebrate muscle, two major types. There's the striated muscle, uh, which is what you're mostly familiar with, and they're responsible for skeletal movements. Um, it's, it's what striated muscles are usually characterized as. And the cardiac muscle, um, it's a special type of striated muscle that surrounds the heart. And then there's the smooth muscles that are part of the involuntary um, system, and they surround the blood vessels, the intestines, and etc. And they're involuntary, they just uh, help your organs to function properly. But nevertheless, they use very similar contraction mechanisms. So there is a lot of uh, ultrastructure and organization to the skeletal muscles. So if you look at a whole muscle, it has many hierarchical levels. So the muscle, of course, is attached through a tendon, usually to a bone, and um, it's, it has an insertion and an origin. It's connecting two things that move. Uh, muscle fibers are long, cylindrical, and multinucleate. They're really kind of odd kinds of cells. The myofibrils, if you look inside of a muscle fiber, there's a bunch of myofibrils, and those are the structures that contain the sarcomeres. The sarcomeres are the contractile units. It's the actual functional unit of striated muscles. And um, it has a very characteristic appearance. And in fact, um, it was studying the morphology that led to a theory of how muscles actually contract. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But anyway, it's made up of myofilaments um, and there are several parts the thin filaments, which are the actin, the thick filaments, which are the myosin, and then structural proteins, titan and nebulin. Okay, so let's look at the actin or the thin filament. It's a helical protein and it's it has winding around it, another protein called tropomyosin, and then the troponin complex. The troponin complex has three subunits. Um, one that binds to calcium, the other one that binds to tropomyosin, and then the third one that binds to the actin and the uh, troponin C. Yeah, and so calcium binds right there usually. And we're going to talk about that because this is actually a really big deal. The myosin is the other, there's the actin and there's the myosin, right? And the myosin uh, are the thick filaments. There are two supercoiled alpha helices, and at the ends is where the action is. It's the amino terminus, and there's these myosin light chains, and they have these little arms, the heads, that bind to the actin. And it's, it's really pretty interesting because um, they all have this sort of like a quarter note shape, and but an interesting thing is if you just have a bunch of these molecules and throw them into a solution, they will naturally align themselves to have all the heads pointed outward. And this is just the thermodynamically least energetic state, so it's very stable. And that's how we have the structure here 
where we have the, the all the little myosin heads pointing out. Okay, so this is what it looks like under a microscope. And you have this very characteristic Z disc in the middle here. Then you have the A band, um, the H zone and the M line, the I band, all of these things. And when researchers first began to study this and they could see these, and then they could see that muscles in different states of contraction had some of those regions changed in size and some of them got shorter and some of them stayed the same length. And so that led them to the sliding filament theory, which we're gonna talk about in just a moment. Um, but if you look, if you actually take cross sections through muscle fibers, depending on where you cut through the, the, the sarcomeres, like say you cut through the Z-band area, you're gonna get these little dots. And that's because you're only cutting through the actin there. And then if you cut through the, um, the A-band, but not in the bear zone, not in the H region, then you're gonna get both fat dots and skinny dots. And that's where you're, you're seeing, you're cross-sectioning through the actin and the myosin. And then if you actually cut through the H region, then you'll only have fat dots because that's where the myosin is. So how do they shorten? Well, there's this long-standing sliding filament theory. And it's basically like if you think about pulling on a rope where the actin or the thin filaments is the rope and the myosin heads are your arms. And you just go hand over hand and pull, pull so when these myosin heads pull on the actin, the, the Z bands get closer together, okay? And eventually it gets to the point where it can't get any shorter and that's maximum contraction. So these sarcomeres are of course in series. So a muscle fiber has many, 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 many sarcomeres in series and all of them will shorten simultaneously. So then the whole muscle fiber shortens. Okay, so you, that's how you get from a long relaxed muscle to a short contracted muscle. And um, so the muscles contract when all the sarcomeres shorten. How do the filaments slide? Well, it's a really interesting story. There's the cross bridge cycle. Cross bridges are basically the projections from the myosin thick filaments that binds to the actin on the thin filaments. And there's three steps. There's the formation of the cross bridge, the power stroke, and the release. And the main players here are actin, myosin, and ATP. And so as you know, muscle movement is expensive and so it costs ATP. Um, but what you may not know, however, is that um, myosin wants to bind to actin. It is, it just really wants to bind to actin and that will just happen passively if it's allowed, <laughs> okay? So you might think that it's the binding that's energetically costly, but it is not. So what, what happens? Okay, well, there's the chemical process with the myosin binding to the actin, and that is the cross bridge. And then there's a structural change, um, which when the myosin head bends, it's called the power stroke. So where the ATP comes in is when you want to release the myosin head and so that it can move and attach to a, the next binding site in the next cycle. Okay, so the, the thermodynamically favorable state is bound and contracted. So it's gonna need ATP to release and start all over again. And that is why um, actually when uh, animals die, you have rigor mortis because everything is bound up and there's no ATP anymore to release or relax the muscle. So the ATP bond breaks the bond between the actin and the myosin. Then the myosin head extends 
And it, this is where the ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and phosphate, but it happens slowly and it attaches to the actin. So the energy that's released is what's used in, in the you know, hydrolyzation of the ATP is what's used to generate force. And once it's attached, the phosphate is released when the bond between the actin and myosin is strengthened and um, energy is released. So the ADP is removed from the myosin and replaced by the ATP. So th it's the cross bridges that develop force. It's a pretty strong attachment, but then the power stroke is what produces the movement. So um, if you think about what generates force, it's gonna be the, the number of cross bridges in parallel. The more fibers you have in parallel that are, that are bound, the greater the force. And that's gonna be proportional to cross-sectional area of the muscle. But the velocity, or how quickly you have movement, actual movement of body parts, is gonna be proportional to the number of sarcomeres in series because it's, the, you know, a longer muscle fiber, once it's contracted, will get much shorter. Okay, so if the bound state is the energetically favorable state, then you might wonder, how do muscles relax? <laughs> well, here's where calcium comes in. Calcium is the gatekeeper. Or uh, I guess you could think of it actually as the gate opener. So troponin and tropomyosin are there all, all the time to block the myosin binding site. So that's why muscles don't always contract in the presence of ATP. It's Think about it. If it wants to bind, then anytime there's an ATP around, your muscles are just gonna start to contract. And you don't want that to happen. You wanna be able to control it. <laughs> so um, so it's the, the, the relaxed state is when these binding sites are blocked, okay? And so what you need calcium for is to move troponin and tropomyosin to the side step aside <laughs> so that the myosin can bind to the actin. This is why our muscles are not contracted all the time. Okay, so how does calcium allow actin and myosin to bind? Well, calcium binds to the troponin, the TNC subunit, and that causes a reorganization of the troponin tropomyosin complex thereby exposing the myosin binding site on the actin, and then the two can bind. So there is absolutely no contraction without calcium because calcium has to move the troponin tropomyosin aside. Where does the calcium come from, you might wonder? Um, it comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is related to the endoplasmic reticulum of normal cells, but in muscle cells, it's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it sequesters calcium. So that there's very little free-floating calcium in the cytosol. It's all stored up in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the main functions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is to actively uptake calcium from the cytosol. So it just soaks, sucks it all up and then it sequesters it so that it keeps the calcium concentration low during resting when we don't want our muscles to contract. And it uses um, calcium magnesium pumps in order to do this. So, when, when are the muscles allowed to contract? It's when there's an action potential that triggers the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release, just release all of the calcium. So now you might wonder, how do you get a coordinated muscle contraction? Because as you can imagine, there are many, many, many sarcomeres involved here and many, many muscle fibers. Well, um, Vertebrate muscles are organized in motor pools, and there are 
nerves, motor neurons that come down and attach to the various uh, pools of muscle fibers and um, their, their end plates are resting on the muscle fibers. So it's called excitation contraction coupling and the muscles are activated by motor neurons. Each motor neuron uh, attaches to its pool, particular pool of muscle fibers. And then, um, so the action potential is actually conducted to all the fibers through this transverse tubule system, the T-tubules, okay? And what they are are really just uh, protrusions of the membrane. So they, they are deep invaginations of the sarcolemma, which are, is the membrane of the muscle fiber, and they penetrate. So when the T-tubules are stimulated by the motor end plate, the neuron, the, the nervous, the action potential travels down the motor neuron, gets to the end plate, then it stimulates the sarcolemma and the T-tubules. Then, um, then, then the action potential is conducted down the T-tubules. So they stick way down into the muscle fiber so that the depolarization can travel all the way in quickly. And so that's what allows a massive coordinated release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is a, another image of what a muscle fiber looks like. And so the sarcolemma is just this cell membrane around and um, it's a per, uh, has a particular form. And um, you see these invaginations here and then these purple things are the T-tubules. So the T-tubules extend into the cell from the sarcolemma and wrap around each myofibril so that the response once, once you get that nervous impulse, bing, they're all coordinated and they can all contract at once. And uh, if you are interested, you should look at the, check out this video. Um, this guy, this person, Blausen, made a really nice video. Okay, so to summarize, motor neurons stimulate the muscle and action potential travels down the T-tubule. The depolarization of the membrane triggers the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then calcium binds to the troponin. The troponin and the tropomyosin reorganize to expose the myosin binding site on the actin. And then it can contract. <laughs> so the breakdown of the ATP allows the myosin head to attach and detach from the actin, creating a cross bridge cycle. And when the cross bridges form and energy is released, that's when force is developed. The myosin, or the thick filaments with all the little heads, pull along the actin, or the thin filaments, and then the sarcomere shortens, and that's the sliding filament theory. The when the sarcomeres shorten, the muscle shortens. It pulls on the elastic or the skeletal elements resulting in motion. So there's a number of important factors in force development. Something called summation, which we're going to talk about next. Um, the length of the sarcomeres, or you know how many sarcomeres are in series, and the velocity of shortening. And um, a lot of the parameters that we think about are work. Work happens when you produce movement, and you can have um, isometric and isotonic contraction. And then you have force and velocity and therefore power of contraction is important for movement. Okay, so what? how do we break down muscle contraction? There's two main types that we like to think about. Um, isotonic contraction and isotonic means uh, same force. So when you have the same tension, um, but the muscle is allowed to shorten. That's when you get movement. There's also isometric contraction, iso, same length. And so when you hold the length of the muscle the same, but you apply tension, that's when the muscle can build up force. For example, like when you flex your muscles or when you're carrying a load at the same height or something like that, um, that's an isometric contraction.
So here's our muscle model, very simple model. And we have our contractile unit, the, or what we think of as the muscle fibers. And it's just a bunch of sarcomeres, but you know we're gonna only draw one for simplicity. It's attached um, via some series elastic components, which are usually tendons, which are um, collagen fibers that don't stretch very much. They're pretty stiff. Um, but they, they do act as springs that store energy. And then there's the parallel elastic components, which are like all the membranes of the, of the muscles. And then there's the load, which is the thing that we're trying to lift or pull or whatever. So in an isotonic contraction, um, we're going to measure the, the length of the muscle that's shortened and measure the force. So if we look through time and we have no change in length um, but increasing force, what's happening is the muscle is contracting, but before you get movement, you're getting a stretch of the series elastic components. You're stretching the tendons. And then finally, you're gonna reach a point where um, you're gonna start to contract you're going to start to get motion because you're going to get shortening of the muscle uh, quite substantially. And then um, that's when you have the movement. Okay, and then you release, you relax, and then it goes back to the, the normal resting length. So what's the importance of these tendons? <laughs> this is Professor Full at UC Berkeley, who is my postdoc advisor. And um, he unfortunately tore his quadriceps tendon. That is the tendon right above your patella or kneecap. Um, so it was pretty gross, but uh, what we learn, and it, it's easily repaired, um, it just takes a bunch of recovery time, but it's a clear illustration of how the tendon transmits force to the skeleton. And it's Primary purposes are to smooth movement and store and return energy. Okay, so how is that different from isometric contraction? Okay, so we, when we have a, a twitch, we're gonna stretch the um, series elastic components. Okay, and we can stretch it quite a lot uh, without having any movement. And so these tendons are bearing a lot of force and you can store the energy. It's like pulling on a spring so that when you let go, then you can have some, some pretty impressive movement. Okay, and um, in order to get the maximum force generated, instead of a single twitch, you need many, many twitches. And that is called tetanus. And this is one of the things you're gonna be studying in the lab this week. Okay, so let's go over motor unit recruitment. We have our motor neurons, they attach to muscle fibers. So the motor unit is the motor neuron and all of its innervated muscle fibers. In an arthropod, uh, you get control in a very different way. Okay, so let's step back. In a vertebrate, you have control by having multiple motor pools. And to get bigger movement, you need to recruit more and more motor units. So uh, control is accomplished by adjusting the number of motor neurons that are firing. Okay, so you recruit more and more motor pools to get more force generated or more movement or faster movement. In an arthropod, instead you have two neurons, not many, not hundreds, not thousands. So in a vertebrate muscle, um, motor, in a, in a vertebrate, sorry, um, nerve is actually a bundle of a huge number of neurons, okay? They're all, each one of them is going down to its motor pool in its associated muscle. In an arthropod, you have exactly two. <laughs> you have an inhibitory motor neuron and an excitatory motor neuron. And this is called polyneuronal innervation because you have one motor neuron that has many, many termini, termini multi-terminal innervation. 
Okay. So in a um, vertebrate, you're going to have an action potential, and it'll be single, just one. And then a, you'll, it, with a little delay, you'll get a twitch. In an arthropod, you're going to have multiple, you're going to have electrotonic potentials. And they're not going to be all or none like an action potential. They're actually graded. So you can have multiple that sum up to produce different strengths of innervation. And what it results in, depending on how many potentials it receives, it's, it will determine the strength of, of the contraction. So it's quite a different system. And this week you're going to be looking at electromyography EMGs. And um, in a vertebrate, that, that's what we're going to be looking at. The muscles are going to be activated by a series of neural signals, which are action potentials or spikes. And as you know, muscles can only contract. So to get uh, the, the limb to return to its original position, which the strategy is to have paired antagonistic muscles, flexors and extensors. Okay, and they're going to contract at opposite times so that you can have contraction and extension, contraction and extension, contraction and extension. And vertebrate EMGs are messy, really messy. It's going to look like this, like a, but, like, like a squiggly psh, and then nothing, and then another squiggly psh, and then nothing okay so if you get that then that's good <laughs> um, however on a arthropod like the cockroach you have these distinct discrete little spikes it's kind of a thing of beauty actually in comparison to the vertebrate EMG okay but both of these are EMGs electromyograms okay so back to the vertebrate um, a single stimulation or action potential is a twitch. Okay, but then um, if you have low frequency multiple stimuli, what you get is an unfused tetanus and it starts to grow. And then with higher frequency stimulation, you get a fused tetanus. And that's when you get the maximum isometric contraction. Okay, so you're going to be looking for tetanus and in, in, in you're going to be measuring EMGs on yourselves. And I hope you have fun because it's really pretty cool. So we have, um, yeah, so the patterns of activation in, in the vertebrate and the arthropod look quite different. And, but it's pretty amazing because the EMG um, on a vertebrate looks like a mess and it produces a nice muscle force. But on an arthropod, it could be as simple as three little spikes, and it will produce the same force. Go figure. <laughs> Differences in design. That's one of the beauties of biology. So I hope you have fun in lab this week and have fun measuring your own muscular electrical activity. Take care.